Welcome to ANA's November webinar. Today's topic is innovations in the surgical treatment of small, medium, and large acoustic neuromas. We are honored to welcome Dr. John Ogalai, otolaryngologist at Keck Medicine of USC, and Dr. Amir Didashti, Director of Cerebrovascular Neurosurgery Research at North Shore University Hospital. I am Melissa Bombick, the Communications Specialist for the Acoustic Neuroma Association, and your moderator today. Before we begin, I'd like to remind our listeners that Giving Tuesday is taking place on November 27th, which is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Giving Tuesday is an annual day of giving that invites individuals like you to support a charity of your choice during the holiday season. This year, we are honored that past ANA board member Jeff Barr will match gifts made on Giving Tuesday up to $5,000. Donations made to ANA on Giving Tuesday will go toward advancing the knowledge and understanding of acoustic neuroma through our ANA patient registry. To learn more, please visit www.anausa.org and click on the Giving Tuesday banner on the home page. I also want to let you know that all attendees are in listen-only mode and will remain that way throughout the webinar. There's a question box on the control panel on your screen that can be used to type comments or questions while Dr. Ogilai and Dr. Dadashti are speaking. If you're having trouble with your audio using your computer speakers, please feel free to call in using the phone number and access code on the confirmation email so that you can listen over the phone. There will be a recording of this webinar that includes the audio and all PowerPoint slides available next week on the ANA website. Please watch our social media sites for notification that the webinar has been uploaded and is available for viewing. The Acoustic Neuroma Association, the premier resource to the acoustic neuroma community, informs, educates, and supports those affected by acoustic neuroma brain tumors. It is ANA's vision to continually improve the lives of acoustic neuroma patients and their families through communication, support, innovation, and partnerships with the medical community. I would like to thank our webinar sponsors whose funds help advance AN education and support as well as increase AN awareness. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. John Ogilai is an internationally recognized otolaryngologist with expertise in ear and skull-based surgery who recently moved from Stanford to lead the USC Caruso Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. His practice focuses on the management of skull-based tumors, such as vestibular schwannoma, also known as acoustic neuroma, and meningioma. He works closely with neurosurgery, radiation oncology, and neuroradiology as part of the, of the USC skull-based team. As director of cerebrovascular neurosurgery research at North Shore University Hospital, Dr. Amir Dadashti is one of the few dual-trained cerebrovascular and skull-based surgeons in the country with two dedicated and separate fellowships. Dr. Dadashti has significant clinical expertise in performing complex intracranial surgery and has been involved in several retrospective and prospective studies relating to cerebrovascular and skull-based neurosurgery. It is now my pleasure to get started and turn the webinar over to our presenters. We're gonna start with Dr. Ogilai. So let me get you going. We can turn the webinar over to you. Dr. Ogilai, are you seeing the I am pop -up seeing box? your slide, Melissa, and I'm seeing my right. webcam. Oh, you are seeing that. Okay. I'm trying to get you control so that you can well, it doesn't seem to be working. Let me see if um I can get it. Huh. to pop up. Is your mouse moving? It doesn't look like it's doing much. It is. It's just this. Um, it doesn't want to switch over. That's funny. We just had it working. If I do it, I know. Let's see if I can. Nope. Uh, let's see if I do it this way.
doesn't seem to want to. Try turning off your webcam, Dr. Oglai, and see if that helps. Turn off my webcam. Yeah. Okay. Change it that way. I think it's because I'm in slideshow mode. Maybe I better turn off slideshow mode. Try that and see if that works. I'm sorry, everyone. We This is touchy. Oh, I don't even... Oh, okay. this is it. Okay. Did that help happening? at all? Um, possibly. Let's try it again. No, nope, it's just not. Um, Dr. Dadashi, I'm going to try and see if I can switch to you. Okay. Um, maybe we can get that going. I can't seem to get that. So I turn my. Uh, It's not offering the um I'm even trying to give you a keyboard and mouse. Um, acceptance for the presenter mode. Yeah, it's not giving you the um the, let me try this. Oh, this is upsetting. It's not offering us the option to switch screens. Maybe if I stop showing my screen, And there we go. Now, Dr. Oglai, it's going to give you the option. Okay, so now we should be viewing your screen. There we go. Sorry about the delay, everybody. Okay, so Dr. Oglai, now we see your... Oh, wait a minute. We see your presentation, and we see your webcam, but we don't have your audio. Can you hear me? Oh, so now you see everything, and you can hear me now. Now we can see you, and now we phone. can hear you. <laughs> okay, there we go. Phew. All right, so you can see the presentation? Yes. Oh, good. All right, well, I'm sorry for the delays, <laughs> but I'm sorry glad we got that, everyone. Uh, all right. Well, Melissa, thank you very much. It, and Amir, it's great to be here with you today. Um, the ANAs had a, a long history of helping our patients, and we've always appreciated um, what you do uh, for our patients and how you are a, a strong advocate for acoustic neuroma. Um, so we really enjoy this opportunity to present. So thanks. Um, so my charge today was to talk about small and medium tumors and the different treatment options. So, yeah, so as you mentioned, I moved from uh, Northern California down to Southern California about a year ago. This is our department of otolaryngology head and neck surgery. And you can see me, I put a box around me there. Just I thought you might like to see. We have a huge group here um, with a lot of research actually dedicated towards hearing loss and um, treating people with uh, and curing hearing loss, actually. Um, so that's our department. And I'm going to be showing some pictures from a atlas, an atlas that I wrote uh, with Colin Driscoll, who's at the Mayo Clinic. And so together, he and I did this atlas. It shows basically how we do a lot of these types of surgeries. And, and we'll, we'll also be talking about other options as well besides surgery, of course. Scott Weldon is the medical illustrationist that, that did the pictures for us. And he's just incredible. You can see one of his, his works here. Okay, so, so this is, I mean, basically what I'm going to do is give you the same story that I tell patients when they come to see me in clinic. So this is a view of the head, and hopefully, can you see my mouse? I'm kind of trying to outline the head here. So, so this is the forehead up at the top, and this is the back of the head, and it's like they sliced it kind of right above the ears and took the top off. 
And so one ear would be sticking out on one side and the other ear would be on the other side. And all of the thinking part of the brain isn't shown here. And so what you're looking at is this section in the middle called the brain stem, and it carries the nerves from the thinking part down to the spinal cord to go to the arms and legs. And then the other part of the brain back here, this bigger part is the cerebellum. That's the balanced part of the brain. And so there are nerves that run back and forth to help give you coordination. And then these yellow structures are nerves. So these are nerves that come off the brain stem and go to the head and neck. So this nerve right here, for example, is the sensory nerve to the face. So for if you touch your forehead or your cheek or your jawline, then that would be, you know, that sensation would go through those nerves. Then here are the other, some more cranial nerves. This is the important ones for uh, vestibular schwannoma, um, or also called, called acoustic neuroma. Um, cranial nerves seven and eight. So they run from the brainstem, they course uh, through this fluid-filled space. It's filled with spinal fluid. And they enter the internal auditory canal, and the nerves run down a tunnel in the bone, and then they branch. So the auditory nerve will go to the, the cochlea here to sense hearing. The vestibular nerve will go to the balance canals to sense when you turn your head. And then the facial nerve is here. It comes and it splits with one branch going up towards the eye, but most of it going uh, down through the ear into your face to move the muscles in your face. So that's the nerve that lets you close your eyes and smile and do things with your facial musculature. And then down below, there are these other uh, cranial nerves that go to your throat, your voice, your shoulder, and to your tongue. So this is kind of um, the skull base. And I'm going to go to the next slide here, and you can see the arrow pointing to that small vestibular schwannoma. And this is typically where they begin. They don't always begin here, but they usually do. It's about halfway down the length of the tunnel. And they, they start on the balance nerve. And it's a tumor, not actually of the nerve fibers itself, but of the, the cells around the nerves that kind of coat them. And they tend to be benign. They grow slowly. Um, and they're in this kind of confined space. And they're really common. It's like one in 100,000 patients gets these. And so... So it's not a rare tumor. In fact, it's the second most common tumor inside the head. So as it grows, it gets a little bit bigger, and it starts to fill up this tunnel in the bone. And, of course, it starts to squeeze the other nerves that are in there. So it might affect your balance because it's in the balance nerve, um, but it can also affect your hearing if it's squeezing the auditory nerve. And I guess in theory it could affect your facial nerve. I've never really seen that except for a couple times. It's pretty rare. The facial nerve is a motor nerve. It's really strong. It would be, it'd be hard to see your facial nerve become paralyzed from a vestibular schwannoma. And then as it gets even bigger, it starts growing out into this fluid-filled space called the cerebellopontine angle. So this is why they call it a CP angle tumor. So this is, I mean, I guess if you were going to call, like, what's a small, what's a medium, and what's a large, like, these would be considered small, and this would even be a small one. As it gets a little bit bigger, it starts pushing on the brain. And then I guess this is probably what I would call a medium tumor. It's about a two centimeter diameter tumor in the cerebellopontine angle. It's starting to irritate the brain. It might cause a little bit more balance problems. And then a large one would be about a three centimeter or bigger where it's really compressing the brain quite a bit and stretching other nerves and causing other problems. So, so my charge is to talk about the small to medium ones. And, uh, you know, for any acoustic neuroma, there's three treatment options. And I'm, I, this audience doesn't really need this talk to them, I'm sure. Um, but observation, stereotactic radiation, or microsurgical removal. And we'll just kind of quickly run through these. Um, so the first one, observation. So when a patient has a headache and gets an MRI scan and an incidental acoustic neuroma is diagnosed, or they notice asymmetric hearing loss, an MRI is ordered, and they, then they notice an acoustic neuroma. They get referred into me. And almost all acoustic neuroma patients that I see, we end up following, at least for a little while. It's rare that I operate immediately. And frankly, um, we do that to see, is this tumor growing? Because a fair number of, a fair percentage of tumors don't even grow. Um, or they grow so slow that maybe we don't have to do anything about it um, within the lifetime of that patient. Kind of depends on a lot of different factors. Um, if you're, you know, in your late 70s, 80s, and your parents died when they were in their 50s and 60s, 
and you've got heart failure and you had a stroke last year, you know, maybe we don't have to treat this tumor. Maybe you can just take it with you. I mean, these are the kind of personalized things we have to think about for every patient and individualize the care. And so typically I'll see a patient back in about six months with a follow-up scan to see if the tumor is growing and what is the growth rate. And if it really didn't change, we'll probably get another scan in about a year. And then that gives us a year and a half of follow-up to see is the thing growing and do we need to do anything. If it's a younger patient and the tumor is growing, then we start thinking we're probably going to need to do something. But um, vestibular schwannoma become more and more prevalent as you get older. And so there's a lot of watching and waiting, and a lot of these tumors just don't change, and so we don't have to, to do anything. So we try to be very conservative with these. Stereotactic radiation, that's another thing we can do. So if the tumor is growing, but it's still small and not causing a lot of problems, we can radiate it. And it's a special type of radiation where, <clears throat> I mean, not like radiation for cancer, it's a much lower dose. But we do an, an MRI scan. Um, we, in fact, here is an MRI scan. And then we take the mouse and we draw a circle around the tumor. This is the yellow line here. That's the thing we want to zap. And then we draw other lines, like this blue line around the brain stem, this pink line around the cochlea. These are things we don't want to zap. And we do this in 3D. And then the computer comes up with an algorithm so that the beams all crisscross on the tumor that we want to zap with a high dose of radiation. But it minimizes the radiation that affects other structures. So it's, a, it's called stereotactic radiation. There's different kind of brand names of devices to deliver it, whether it be a cyber knife, a gamma knife, Novalis, proton beam, whatever. I mean, it's kind of all radiation. And there are subtle differences between the types. But in the end, the goal is not to melt the tumor away. It, the goal is to just get it to stop growing. And if it can just stay that way, then you don't have to do anything That's other than that. So that would be wonderful. And I would say about 25% of my patients um, you know, the tumor, we've been following it, the tumor is growing, and then they, they decide they would like stereotactic radiation, and then we just do that. And there's not a lot of side effects from it. Uh, hearing loss is certainly something that can happen, because as the tumor swells in the internal auditory canal, in that tunnel in the bone, um, which it will, because the radiation damages the cells, so it makes them become inflamed and swell, it will affect um, the auditory nerve, and also possibly the blood vessel that goes from the brain to the inner ear through the, the internal auditory canal. So it's not unusual for patients to, to have hearing loss after radiation for a small acoustic neuroma. So if the tumor is not growing, it's even better if we don't even have to radiate in the first place. Um, the facial nerve is there. It can be affected by radiation. I've seen that. It's not super common, but it does happen occasionally. Um, one of the scary things about radiation, I guess, is if you're really young and you get radiation, well, could I get a tumor caused by the radiation 20 to 30 years later? Um, this is a much lower dose of radiation than the typical high doses where you know, that's known to occur. There have been reports of cancer occurring 20 to 30 years later. Um, it's unlikely, though. Um, <clears throat> other issues are, well, what if I radiate the tumor and, and then it kind of starts, keeps growing, it doesn't stop it. Well, we could try re-radiating it, giving it a higher dose, and, or we could go take it out. Now, taking it out is often a little tricky because it tends to get pretty sticky after radiation, um, and that kind of puts your facial nerve at risk. Okay, the third thing, oh, oh, sorry, this, this is just a, another one, uh, as patient selection for stereotactic radiation. So an ideal candidate is, you see the small tumor here, it's separated from the brain. We can give it, there's a nice uh, rim of uh, radiation we can give around this, and it, the gradient before it hits the brain will be pretty good. Here's a patient that had radiation where it was, it was probably not an ideal candidate. It was a very large tumor. You can see it, the tumor became necrotic in the center, this black spot, but look at all the damage to the surrounding brain. And, it, and it, it's basically because you can't tell the radiation to stop right at the edge of the tumor. I mean, there's going to be a gradient, and some of the surrounding brain will get hit with a, a lower dose of radiation, but still enough to cause damage. So, so radiation is better for older patients with smaller tumors. Okay, surgery. So about roughly a third of my patients end up going to surgery. And for small tumors, if you have good hearing, 
The standard um, approach that we typically would do would be a middle fossa approach. And <clears throat> so this is a slightly different view of the head. You can see it's kind of a side view. And, and you see this bone right here. This is the skull. And you have to make a window in the skull. And then you, you don't go into the brain. There's this yellow <clears throat> tissue here called the dura. That's the lining around the brain. So we don't actually see the brain there. We just kind of lift it up. And then we drill away this bone to get to the tumor. And you can see the tumor right here. Um, you can also see the facial nerve, this yellow nerve, right on top of the tumor. And so one of the downsides of the middle fossa is the facial nerve is the first thing you see. But one of the best things about the middle fossa is the auditory nerve is way on the bottom, so it's out of the way. So that's why it's so good for hearing preservation. So this is a case. This is a, <clears throat> an MRI of a 27-year-old patient of mine. She had disequilibrium. She became very dizzy one day, was referred in to see me. We got an MRI and we saw this vestibular schwannoma. And she had good hearing and she's young and so we went ahead and took it out. This was, usually we would follow these nowadays, but this was a few years ago when it wasn't so common to follow patients. And you can see her post-op MRI and there's no tumor there. There's a little bit of white along the edge. That's just post-operative inflammation. So that's, that's what it looks like after you take out a tumor with the middle fossa approach. Uh, this was her hearing before surgery. See how normal the hearing was. These are frequencies. And then the higher the number is, the worse the hearing is. So zero is like the hearing of an 18-year-old. And then like 90 to 100 would be deaf. And then postoperatively, you can see she still had good hearing. You don't always have good hearing after the middle fossa approach, but on a small tumor, uh, where everything goes well, this is what we like to see. This is actually a diagram of what we would see in surgery with the middle fossa approach. So we've <clears throat> we've opened up a window in the skull. We've kind of retracting up the dura, and the brain is underneath all that. We can't see it. And then we've drilled away some bone here to get to the internal auditory canal. And the yellow facial nerve is right on top, and this orange tumor is right kind of below it. And the black dotted line just shows how we make an opening in the tumor to remove the tumor. And once we've kind of debulked it and taken a lot of the pressure out, off the nerves, then we go in and very carefully dissect the tumor off the facial nerve, the F, and the cochlear nerve or auditory nerve, C. And by saving those two nerves, then the goal would be to save normal facial nerve function and normal hearing. Now, if the tumor gets bigger, like two centimeters or so, <clears throat> then we can't really do that with the middle fossa approach. It doesn't give us a big enough opening. So then we're thinking about an, a what's called a posterior approach or something with an incision behind the ear. And the, the key problem is that there's this vein, the sigmoid sinus, right in the way. So you have to decide, do you want to make a window in the skull behind the vein or do you want to make a window in the skull in front of the vein to get to that tumor? So there's two ways to do that. So if you go behind the vein, it's called the retrosigmoid approach. And in that case, we do retract the brain a little bit more to get to that tumor. And in the trans-labyrinthine approach, we go in front of the vein, and there's less retraction of the brain. But the downside is you have to drill right through the ear. So that means there's not going to be any hearing in that ear. So here is a 56-year-old male that had, had slight hearing loss. I didn't have his audiogram, so I couldn't show it to you. But it was a mild hearing loss in the left ear. And you can see this um, vestibular schwannoma here. And so we did a retrosigmoid approach. And this is the postoperative MRI. And you can maybe you can see this black bone right here. And you see it's not there anymore. This, is, this would be the bone right here, but I drilled it away to take out that tumor. And he had a good um, hearing preservation. Not, not the same as it was before, but it did drop a little bit, but very good. And this is the view you see with the retrosigmoid approach. It's also pretty good for hearing preservation. Um, the facial nerve is under the tumor in this case. And so it's even, it's really nice for the facial nerve because from my point of view, it's even less dissection on the facial nerve. Hearing preservation, probably not quite as good as the um, middle fossa approaches for smaller tumors, but for larger tumors, it's the best way to do it. And here's a third case. This is a 42-year-old a female who had um, 
uh, lost pretty much all of her hearing in her left ear. And an MRI was ordered and they found this vestibular schwannoma. And <clears throat> because she had no hearing, we ended up doing a translabyrinthine approach. And so you can see in this case, the tumor's gone postoperatively. And this big gray thing here is some fat that we take from the stomach. We remove a little bit of fat and put it in here to seal things up. And this is the kind of uh, view that we see with a translabyrinthine approach. It's basically the same view as a retrosigmoid approach. It's a little less brain retraction. I'm not sure the brain retraction is that big of a, of a problem, per se. So if there's any hope of saving hearing, we always would do so. So, um, you know, fundamentally, there are the three options to treat acoustic neuroma. And then there are three different approaches if you need surgery. And all of these things are really a decision that need to be made together with um, with your physician. So you have to find a physician that you can talk about all these different issues for. I mean, a lot of it depends upon your hearing status, how dizzy you are. If you're more dizzy, sometimes taking it out helps resolve the dizziness. How big is the tumor? Well, where is the tumor? Does it go all the way down the length of the internal ulcer canal, or is it just at the lip of the acoustic, uh, at the porous acousticus? How fast is your tumor growing? And then, like, how healthy are you? I mean, can you take a surgery, or is, is radiation a better thing for you? And social considerations are really important, especially when this is hitting you kind of, you know, if it hits you more in midlife, you know, what is your career? If, you're, if sales are a big thing for you, then you really want to minimize any risk to your facial nerve. Um, <clears throat> then you may want to, to, to maybe not have the, the, the middle fossa approach because there is a slightly higher risk of a temporary facial nerve weakness. Long term, it's still just as good, but temporary after surgery, yeah, it's a little higher. Um, we talked about age and your expected lifespan. Children, I mean, I've had patients with young children, and you know they want to wait for them to get a little older before going through a surgery of this kind of magnitude. And the good thing about a vestibular schwannoma is that you can wait. It's very rare to have a rush to get to surgery. Um, your lifestyle, how active are you? What kind of sports do you do? And you have like trips or things coming up. This the the lady in this picture is uh, Dawn. She's um, a physician's assistant uh, that works with our neurosurgeon uh, as part of our group. And you can see she had a vestibular schwannoma, and you can see her exercising in the other picture. And so she has a very active lifestyle um, after treatment. Um, oh, so just a, a shameless plug for our program. If you're in LA, you're welcome to come see us. We'd love to to meet you. We have a big group of people that we all kind of focus on what the patient's individual needs are, and that we can help get you through through the, um, through, through the care for your tumor. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Ogilai. Let's go ahead and try this again. Let's see if we can get this switched over. There we go. To Dr. Dadashti. And Dr. Dadashti, now we see your screen and your... Um, webcam. Can you see my presentation? So you can, yep. Yes. I can see okay. your presentation. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So, Melissa, thank you very much for organizing this and giving me the honor of being part of this. And thanks to John for starting this uh, so well and so comprehensive. And um, also thanks to ANA. I have been involved uh, with ANA for the past few years. Uh, in any way or shape I can, I have uh, participated in local um, acoustic neuroma associations meeting with patients. Sometimes I have seen my own patients and it's really gratifying to see the patient be able to help them and answer their questions. This is really what the, the patients, who, whether themselves or their family have a uh, problem with acoustic neuroma, they really want to hear uh, the, the words from the specialists that what is the uh, outcome what would be what they were looking in the next five, 10 years, if there is a residual tumor, or if there is a tumor that they are observing, or if there is any chance of recuperation for any neurological deficit. So uh, John uh, gave a great talk on the small and medium-sized vestibular schwannoma, and I'm going to focus mainly on the large one. And uh, so as uh, Melissa mentioned, I uh, work in New York, I'm um, a, a neurosurgeon, um, Half of my practice is in cerebrovascular surgery, it would be brain aneurysms and uh, all the brain vessels, brain artery venous malformation. And the other half is a skull based surgery, which includes obviously the vestibular schwannoma. 
In terms of uh, the uh, management of these patients, uh, probably half of the patients that I see, they have large uh, or very large vestibular shawn, while the other have are small or medium. And uh, I share completely what uh, Dr. Ogalai mentioned in regards to the management. There are really some of those small tumors that we treat with surgery, some that we observe, some we sort of refer to uh, gamma knife radio surgery, which I do also myself. But it really depends to patient's age and the patient's uh, preference. And, uh, you know, some of our patients are seeing several specialists before deciding for a treatment. And really, at the end of the day, the patients has a very important role in making the final decision what treatment they would like to have. These are all relevant for small and medium size, but really for very large or large vestibular schwannoma, there is not that many options. And I will go through that. My presentation might be a little bit more more graphic than Dr. Ogalai, uh, so I, I warn you, there might be a couple of surgical videos, uh, but uh, I will try to skip quickly through those. So um, I'm just trying to see, just think that, okay, so if you look at the uh, um, parameters of uh, chance of facial nerve function after treatment of these tumors, because as I mentioned, the large tumors most of the time they need surgery. And um, the chance of a patient's uh, remaining with a conservative management is low. Now, there are some tumors uh, that have very few symptoms and then on the older patients we can watch them. But I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about those large tumors for which uh, really the surgery is the only good options. Because even radiations or a fractionated radiation which we can give to some tumors are not most of the time efficient. So in terms of the surgery for large tumors, as you can see, the parameters of um, um, prediction of facial nerve function, which is the most important thing for large vestibular schwannomas, because uh, among the deficit that a patient can have, we just talked about the hearing preservation. For large tumors, uh, most of the time the hearing is not functional, or if it is functional, unfortunately, the chance of preserving hearing for very large tumor is low. It's not zero, but it's not very high. So the goal, and at least my goal in our department is that every single patient with a vestibular schwannoma, I would like him to have, him or her to have a normal facial nerve function at short-term follow-up. Far parameters that are in relation to that, as you can read by yourself, I'm not gonna go over this text, but you can see there are several features in tumors, the larger tumor, obviously, if the tumor has a very anterior or inferior extension into the um, skull base. Uh, some tumors with uh, cystic features or when the tumors are oval shape, uh, they can have uh, a worse neurological function in terms of the facial nerve. Now, uh, Dr. Rugolai mentioned that the patient with vestibular schwannoma rarely present with facial nerve deficit, but it can happen. So those patients who come to us with already a facial nerve weakness, uh, they have a higher risk of having a facial nerve uh, worsening function after surgery. And I have seen a few of those with uh, large tumors, although it's not very frequent. Um, in terms of the um, tumor and the location of the facial nerve, this uh, yellow bar that you can see, little uh, line that you can see, I don't know if my arrow is visible. Um, so is my arrow visible, uh, Melissa, on these pictures? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so you can see this is the facial nerve in the tumor. And this picture summarizes why in these large tumors the facial nerve preservation becomes complicated. Because in some of the tumor, the facial nerve is completely embedded inside the tumor. And obviously our job is to be able to identify that and with the sophisticated monitoring uh, technique we have during the surgery, we can do that. Uh, but that will show you why some of the tumors have um, a, um, a difficult surgery because of the fact that the facial nerve cannot be easily identified or cannot be easily dissected away from the tumor. And this is rare uh, that the facial nerve be at the surface of the tumor on the back part when we expose the tumor, but it can happen in one person of the time, and that will make the surgery more difficult because uh, specifically if we use the approach that is coming from the back, that as Dr. Ogolai mentioned, the retrosigmoid craniotomy, 
Uh, if the facial nerve is sitting in the back of the tumor, uh, which is rare, less than 1%, that will make the surgery very difficult. But if it's in front or below the tumor, then that will make the surgery more convenient in terms of removal of the tumor and separation of the facial nerve. Now, uh, for hearing preservation, I very briefly touch base on, as you can see, the larger the tumor, that's the take home message for you would be the larger the tumor, the lower the chance of preserving the hearing in this large tumor. So less than a quarter of tumors, less than a quarter of the patient with very large tumor, which means three centimeter or four or above, uh, will end up with a functional hearing. And the functional hearing basically, uh, very uh, easy way of um, evaluating the hearing for me, um, uh, and John, I apologize if I make this uh, very simple, is if the patient can answer the phone uh, with the ear or not. If the patient cannot answer the phone, that to me, that hearing is not functional. And if they can answer the phone, that's functional. Obviously, this is not, doesn't have the granularity of the tests that Dr. Ogolai will do to evaluate the hearing, but I think this is an important uh, feature. And uh, only a quarter or less than a uh, that of patients with very large tumor will end up having a hearing preservation after surgery. But again, the goal, the main goal would be to preserve the facial nerve function. If you look at the very large series, you can see that we can have about 92% preservation of the facial nerve. And this is coming from probably the most experienced vestibular schwannoma surgeon in the world. And you can see 92% facial nerve integrity preservation for large vestibular schwannoma. Having said that, does not mean that if a facial nerve is preserved during the surgery, the outcome will be excellent. So our goal is to preserve the nerve, but the patients might still have a weak nerve and a paralyzed face after surgery at short term or at long term. And you can see that if the tumor is more than four centimeters compared to less than four centimeters, the chance of having an excellent facial nerve function is lower. 75% is good but it's not perfect because 25% will end up with uh, some degree of facial weakness, which could be debilitating specifically uh, for younger patients. Now, um, because the surgery for large tumors is difficult and radical resection can cause problem with the facial nerve, and specifically with the advances in radiation and gamma knife radio surgery, uh, there has been many, many, many studies that advocates for a less aggressive resection, possibly followed by gamma knife, in terms of uh, reaching a better facial nerve outcome. Now, I have to say this is extremely debatable, and it's extremely debatable among uh, skull-based surgeons, and depending on who are you talking to, that particular person might be completely against or completely in favor of this strategy. And the other thing is that when we go, instead of completely removing tumor to, tumor to partially removing the tumor, then there will be a significant amount of variation between what does that mean, the partial removal? Is it 30%? Is it 50%? Is it 70%? Is it 98%? Or what is that exactly? So this is a very important feature. And there are several studies you can read by yourself here, the results. This one in particular, there are partial decompression is very, uh, I would say, relatively shy. And you can see that the results of the facial nerve function in this particular study in patients who had decompression only, not complete resection of the tumor, followed by radio surgery, has been pretty good, 89% uh, uh, facial nerve preservation. But there is a significant amount of the tumor left. So this is, uh, you can be uh, the judge yourself to see if this is ideal to have half of the tumor left after a major surgery and undergo another a treatment by radiation and uh, having a relatively good facial nerve outcome, that's correct, but then you still have the tumor and the consequence of the further growth in the future. And uh, again, another study showing the same strategy and you can see the results for facial nerves are good. So when we look at this, this idea becomes appealing that we should probably be a little bit less aggressive with treatment of these very large schwannomas for the price of preserving and having a better facial nerve outcome. But then we have to identify what is that amount of aggressiveness that we would like to decrease. Personally, I do not believe in partial resection. And uh, I think that uh, 
the surgery should be done with the goal of the as maximal as resection as possible. However, the facial nerve comes first, and that should be preserved, and the patient should have a good outcome. These are the pictures. You can look at the, uh, this is a, a study from uh, Lausanne in Switzerland, and you can see the pictures on the left, a tumor has been resected. So you can see here on the left, very left side, is a large tumor resected to the size that is smaller. And this patient then will have uh, gamma knife radio surgery. They have an excellent facial nerve uh, results. Now you can go on the right side of the picture, you can see there is a patient who has been treated, had one surgery for decompression, there is a significant amount of tumor left. They did one gamma knife radio surgery. The tumor grew back and they did a second resection here and then a second gamma knife radio surgery. And we are left still with the lowest uh, right, far right picture. You see there is a still a significant amount of the tumor left and the patient already has had four procedures. Um, I don't think this is what we would like to have in 2018 as the best treatment option for, um, uh, for our patients with vestibular schwannoma. Obviously, the results are excellent. Facial nerve uh, preservation is 100% and the results are good, but I think we should be able to achieve a better, at least radiological outcome, and we don't even know what's gonna happen to this residual tumor after four procedures. Uh, one other technical aspect uh, uh, for us, uh, at least as I'm, as I'm concerned, so I, in terms of the surgery, Dr. Ogol, I mentioned, several technical strategies. Uh, I prefer the retrosigmoid craniotomy for almost every single vestibular schwannoma. And for the large tumors, I do this surgery with the semi-sitting position. The patient is sitting. This will allow a very nice uh, dissection around the nerves without so much bleeding. And I believe that will help in having a better outcome. Now, um, I will go just show you a few cases of this large tumor. As you can see, this is one of the large tumors. I started my practice with having the strategy of complete resection, and I changed that very recently. You can see here, these are large tumors. This is surgery, I'm gonna skip on that. This patient, you can see his full stop function, and the tumor is completely resected. He had a very good facial nerve function after surgery. Another tumor, a cystic tumor, remove this tumor uh, completely. And this is the post-op uh, resection. The patient had a uh, decreased hearing, but the hearing was functional. This, this particular patient was lucky with the functional hearing at the end and a good resection. And we can get to this kind of tumor, as you can see, very large tumor with mass effect on the brainstem. This is a patient with a neurofibromatosis. In this patient, again, I went for a complete resection. Uh, there was some degree of facial weakness after surgery, but improved that one year. The patient would never had a normal facial nerve function, uh, but it was a grade three, what we consider acceptable for such a large tumor. However, um, there are situations like this. You can see this is a massive tumor in a 27-year-old, and I have a series of these tumors uh, in young patients presenting with a significant mass effect. This was with a facial nerve deficit already to begin with. And you can see this patient uh, was uh, debilitated. He couldn't, she couldn't walk very well, hearing loss, and all the symptoms that can come with these large tumors. And in this tumor, and that was a few years ago, when I went for a strat the same strategy for complete resection, and I lost the facial nerve during the surgery, at, almost at the very end of the surgery, and I had to use a grafting for the facial nerve. And we see that uh, this is the results, and I did the grafting. This patient's facial nerve function fortunately improved uh, to a great three after one year and the grafting worked not i assume i have not done that very often obviously this is the only time i did the grafting but from what i hear the uh, improvement after grafting is not always ideal but this patient received a uh, function at grade three which is acceptable but after several years of experience and by looking at what happens to our uh, skull based society and the surgery for vestibular schwannoma i thought that probably there should be a gray zone between a, a complete resection and a subtotal resection. And for the past uh, year or so, I have switched my strategy to the strategy of the near total resection. And that means leaving just a very little bit of the tumor around the facial nerve. And uh, this is a patient, recent patient with the grade 4B vestibular schwannoma, some mass effect over uh, the brainstem, as you can see. I, this is a, again, this is a video. If you do not like that, I'm going to just show you a, a few seconds. Uh, this is a patient's uh, uh, 
uh, obviously this is the uh, right side of the patients. And what I would like to show here, this is once this is the tumor. This is the tumor vestibular stroma. How it looks like during the surgery is a relatively non-vascular. Is not bleeding much in general. And this is the nerves that are we are separating around. And I what what I would like to show here at the end of the surgery, you will see that there is a little bit here when the, the tumor is being uh, separated. This is a little bit of the tumor left on the nerve that is very adherent at the location just here. So I can just pause it here and show you. This is the area uh, uh, that this part of the tumor is extremely adherent. So I intentionally leave this in place. The rest of the tumor is called all out. And this nerve that you can see, this is the fourth cranial nerve that is responsible for movement of the eye. All the other cranial nerves are preserved. The facial nerve is, if you can see my arrow, is right there following behind this tumor, going into the internal auditory canal that Dr. Ogalai mentioned and showed. And this is what we get after surgery. There is just a tiny, tiny residual here. And uh, you can see this strategy has been done now for several patients that you can see. This is another young patient with a large tumor. And I followed the subtotal, near total resection strategy. You can see this is the residual that is left. We, volume, we anal analyze in a volumetric fashion, and this is about 97, 98% resection. Another one, young patient, this massive tumor, and the goal was to have a good facial nerve function even at the very beginning. And all this patient, fortunately, and this is, again, you can see this is a near total resection, leaving a little bit of a residual tumor around. And the good news is that if you look at the series, and I have realized that in my own experience that these patients have, a, even if that little remnant is uh, not substantial, but just having this strategy, not going for that very last adherent part of the tumor that is stuck to the most uh, vulnerable part of the nerve, will uh, achieve a better result even immediately. So we can see all these patients who had near total resection had a grade one or two facial nerve function 100% uh, of the time uh, at short-term follow-up, and that means six weeks post-op, because I see all the patients at six weeks. Well, if you look at the whole series, um, at six weeks, uh, there was initially 10% uh, and then went down to 4% in very large tumor a facial nerve weakness that is worse than grade one and two and three. So basically the strategy of a near total resection, at least in our hand, has helped a lot our patients. And uh, we have had other complications in these surgeries, but obviously these are complications inherent to these complex surgeries, but none of them fortunately were any, uh, had any seriousness in. And uh, the concern that I have with what is happening in our society right now with the subtotal resection is that uh, the, this surgery, if it's done in a minimal fashion, it's not helpful. So it's a total decompression by going inside the tumor, inside a very large tumor, and removing only 40% or 50% of 60% of the tumor. At least as far as I'm concerned, this is not a right strategy for these tumors. Uh, but there are other ways to uh, preserve the nerve and achieve a better resection, as I just showed. And I think that uh, the fact uh, that there is wide variety of uh, the degree of subtotal resection uh, makes our field even more complex now because uh, the bef beforehand was total resection or nothing. Now we have a wide variety of subtotal resection. And I think our patients are very smart and they look into the literature, they look into uh, the other doctors and specialists, and they need to know that subtotal resection has a variety of uh, uh, degree and levels, and uh, they should know uh, what they are um, accepting as a treatment option when they discuss with their uh, surgeons. I think there is a uh, improvement, at least in my experience, from a gross total resection to near total resection, which means about 98%, with an apparent better facial nerve function. So this is what I do now for all patients with very large tumors. Now, obviously, if a tumor is very easily separable from that last little bit, uh, of the nerve, we will do it. But most of the time in this very large tumor, I have uh, now opted to leave that little residual. And uh, it's also, I would like to emphasize, as uh, you saw that USC is a, a center of excellence for acoustic neuroma surgery. These surgeries specifically for a very large tumor uh, should be done in the center of excellence uh, because uh, 
the competency comes with experience, and this experience comes with seeing lots of patients, different degree of complexity, and a surgical team with combination of ENT and neurosurgeons and collaborate with each other. And at the end of the day, our goal is to make our patients uh, uh, happy and with good uh, outcome, which in vestibular schwannoma would be an outcome for facial nerve and uh, hopefully hearing preservation. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dadashti. And, um, and uh, Dr. Ogilai, if you want to turn your webcam back on, then um, we can ask a couple questions. We have a few more minutes that we can go through a few. Um, we had a question about um, acoustic neuroma treatment and um, both both surgical and uh, radiation. And if there's the potential for gradual loss of cranial nerve function over the middle term, like say seven years or so, um, is is one um, tactic more damaging to these cranial nerves that are, you know, the vestibular and the facial and everything that we've been discussing? Than the other, do you find, or um, or do you see that gradual um, loss over time? Uh, I mean, I can answer that, Melissa. Uh, okay. Amir, that was a wonderful talk. I agree with just about everything you said. Um, in particular, the near total versus subtotal resection versus total resection. Um, the so the issue is if you've got a small tumor and you radiate it and you save hearing immediately, what's gonna happen over the, the next five to 10 years versus if mm -hmm. you do surgery and you take it out and you save hearing, what's gonna happen over the next five to 10 years? Am I, mm -hmm. am I understanding correctly? Basically, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think if you save hearing with either radi, I mean, it takes about a year before, before you would lose hearing with the radiation anyway. So you, know, you, you radiate a small tumor, it takes a few months to start swelling, you start losing hearing, and then you get a hearing test at the end probably six to 12 months later, and then you'll know, did you save hearing? But yeah, the the changes that radiation causes to the small blood vessels um, in the inner ear takes time to develop and they progressively get worse, and you so you do progressively lose hearing um, over time. One of the issues has been with the studies is that um, hearing tests are really only done in otolaryngology offices. And so radiation therapists don't typically do hearing tests. <laughs> and so they'll do something like, well, you know, like you kind of mentioned too, uh, Amir, like, well, he can hear on the phone. Or, he, you know, he feels like he can hear. But it isn't a, uh, like the level of hearing. It is, so it isn't as detailed. And so when you start doing those detailed kind of studies, you actually see that you might lose hearing with surgery too, even after a few years, although it seems to stand the test of time better than radiation. Okay. And Dr. Dadashti, did you have anything to add? No, I think uh, John's answer was uh, complete. Okay, great. Um, what about, uh, what, can you explain again um, what makes surgery complicated after radiation? I know Dr. Ogilai, you mentioned that it, it's a little sticky, but what, what is it that makes it um, or is it more complicated uh, following radiation to do surgery on acoustic neuroma? You want me to answer, or sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, the problem with the you know it's it's interesting because radiation does not make every surgery complex. I do surgery for arteriovenous malformations, and uh, sometimes I operate those that have had gamma knife before, and that actually makes the surgery easier for ABM because the brain around sort of give up the connection to the ABM. The problem with vestibular schwannoma is the cranial nerves. The cranial nerve would do not give up after radiation, and they get even more stuck to the tumor. Now, um, fortunately, I did not have uh, the uh, obligation of operating on many I'm losing it. Yeah, Dr. Dashi, I can't hear you. I don't know if he can hear us. He's still talking. Shoot, he's still going, yeah. Yeah. I can't hear. Well, maybe I can pick up where he left off. <laughs> yeah. I know where he's that's going. Exactly I, mean, I, I have had the you. opportunity to operate on a bunch of tumors that had been radiated before and then kept growing. And some are really sticky because the facial nerve 
sticks to the tumor, and it can be really hard to take the tumor off the nerve without damaging the nerve. Mm -hmm. And then I've had some where it you wouldn't even know they had had radiation before. It was just like a brand new acoustic uh, neuroma. And I'm assuming that they didn't give enough radiation. That's why it grew. So uh, it, it's kind of tough to say. I Frankly, though, I prefer operating when it hasn't had radiation. Mm-hmm. Um... So a common thing and, in our, you know, okay. it kind of came up in that talk too, and I, I want to make sure that it's it's clear. Of, if you don't remove all of the tumor, that's fine because the goal is to improve a patient's quality of life. Mm -hmm. You do have to watch that residual tumor with MRIs over time, and if the remnant starts growing, then you need to, you know, radiate it. But it's a smaller remnant, so you can radiate it more safely. Sure. Okay. And um, there was a question um, about um, endoscopic ear surgery as an option for small acoustic neuroma. Um, is that something that um, you consider as well or not? Yeah, this is, you know, anytime there's a new tool, we try to figure out interesting ways of using it. And so endoscopes have been used in nasal surgeries now for about 20 some years. And probably in the last 10 years, people have been um, using them in the ear. And we use endoscopes because the nice thing about it is it lets you look wherever the tip of the endoscope is. So if you stick it in there, you get kind of a bird's eye view. And so the, the view is better. The downside is you have to use one hand to hold the endoscope. So you're only operating with one hand mm. instead of with two hands. And okay. so it perhaps isn't quite as delicate. If you want to take out a vestibular schwannoma endoscopically, through the ear, I mean, what I've heard about is going through the ear canal itself and then drilling through the eardrum and through the inner ear to get to a tumor. And so this would be a case where there would be no hearing preservation. Right. And it would be okay. basically very similar to what we do going behind the ear through the translabyrinthine approach. Uh, although perhaps, I mean, it's you wouldn't have the incision behind the ear. Okay. Um, I think we have lost Dr. Dadashti. Um, I really only have, I think, um, one other question. There's a question about um, about basically about balance um, and gait functions, but balance um, for the most part. And is there a treatment that you've seen, um, particularly with with um, the smaller and medium-sized tumors that affects balance better one way or the other post-treatment. Yeah. So, I mean, if you have balance issues and you have a vestibular schwannoma, then if it if you can live with it and the tumor's not growing, then you just live with it. We observe it if it's a small tumor. Now, if you mm -hmm. can't live with it, then we have to treat it. And radiation might stop the tumor from growing, but it tends not to improve dizziness. So I'd, mm -hmm. I'd lean more towards removing it. Now, as you might have noticed in the pictures, take out a vestibular schwannoma, it's not just, um, you know, scooping out a tumor. There's, it's in the middle of a vestibular nerve. So it's like a rope and the nerve's like a rope and there's a tumor right in the middle of it that's infiltrated into it. You actually have to cut mm -hmm. it on either side. And that makes people a little bit dizzy right away, but they accommodate. Sure brains learn, and then you're not dizzy after a while um, because you've got balance canals on the other side that your brain can, can learn to use with. And we have a comprehensive vestibular imbalance team, as do many uh, centers of excellence, to help patients get through that tough period right after surgery. Exactly. I'm sorry, okay. I got disconnected for some reason. My oh, good. I'm glad you're back. <laughs> my screen got disconnected. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I thought it was from uh, um, the network but anyways i don't have the screen but i'm on the phone so i can if there okay. is any um questions or anything i can great so. yes um well you mentioned dr uh, dadashti in your talk um uh a patient that had nf2 how does your approach to acoustic norma vary if the patient does have uh nf2 so the NF2 patients in general, uh, our criteria is that we only treat the uh, the tumor that is symptomatic because it's difficult to achieve a cure in these patients. Although if it's only the problem with the vestibular schwannoma and nothing else, 
uh, obviously, even if it's a bilateral disease, we can treat those patients, we can preserve hearing in both ears, uh, as long as the hearing is preserved at the beginning and the tumors are not very large. But my uh, strategy in general is that I will treat the side that has a larger tumor, the side that the hearing is less good, and hopefully that side is the symptomatic side. And uh, then we will see if the other side tumor is uh, very small and the hearing is preserved, we can watch it for now. If uh, the, we see any uh, sign of decline in hearing gradually, it's not unreasonable to be proactive and surgically treated the other side because we can preserve hearing in neurofibromatosis too and uh, remove the tumor. But the general uh, feeling is that we would like to treat on the symptomatic tumor and an asymptomatic lesion, we would leave it alone. Uh, I don't know if, John, do you agree with that, or what is your strategy for those? Yeah, I agree. These are tough patients because they have a genetic disease. It's present in every cell in their body, and they get tumors on every nerve in their body, or they could. If it's a really small tumor, I like to go operate. I'll do a mid-fossa and take it out so that we can preserve their hearing. If it's starting to affect their hearing, then I become very conservative. I might do an internal auditory canal decompression to take the pressure off the auditory nerve, but not risk their hearing. 90% of patients with NF2 go deaf in both ears, so it's a bad disease. And as the tumor gets bigger, and if we have to take it out, if they're symptomatic, then we take it out and we'll place a brainstem implant so that they can hear again. Okay. Okay. Um, and what about a tumor, and I know that both of you talked about this a little bit, but a tumor that is really surrounding the facial nerve, um, is that is that a um, a case where you would consider radiation or um, or I'm surgery? I'm sorry, what did you or say about the, there, tumor, the tumor? Is, the tumor the, is how about the facial nerve? Surrounding the facial nerve. Mm -hmm. so, so it kind of wrapped around the facial nerve. So um, when you have a case like that, are there other factors that you consider, or is it generally one way or the other, radiation versus surgery? How do you treat that? Well, when the tumor gets to this large size, most of the time the facial nerve is somehow surrounded by the tumor, and mm -hmm. we just have to identify the facial nerve and separate that. The, um, mm -hmm. the complexity of what happens when the tumor, the facial nerve is really engulfed by the tumor, which is fortunately not all the time, then that will become the surgery more difficult because uh, the chance of uh, not necessarily losing the facial nerve, but the manipulation around the facial nerve to get it separate from the tumor is so much more that that will make the facial nerve weak. And that's why sometimes that the facial nerve is preserved during the surgery, but the patient still has a paralyzed or weak face just because the facial nerve has been manipulated or the vascular supply to it has been so compromised because of the manipulation during the surgery. So that's the, another reason why for some of those tumors where there is extremely adherent, extreme adherent to the facial nerve, uh, we leave a little bit of the tumor to uh, preserve um, the integrity and also the vascular supply to the facial nerve. And obviously we have monitoring during the surgery and we can check the function of the facial nerve during the surgery and make sure that we keep the function the same way that we start the surgery at the end. So these are the things that will allow us to uh, monitor the function and the extent of resection. And obviously, if there is a significant residual after surgery, then that will need um, probably an upfront radiation treatment. But with the strategy of a near total resection, we do not need to do an upfront radiation. So this patient that I showed with near total resection, all of them I've been just following and I have not done uh, radiation to any of those yet, unless if we see further growth in the years to come. John? Yeah, I agree. I mean, we wrote a paper on the near total versus subtotal, and the rate of recurrence on a near total is about 3%. And that's really just a scrap of tumor in the mid portion of the facial nerve, right around the area of the porous acousticus, like you showed in your video. If you do a subtotal where you leave much more, it's, I think it's still an acceptable thing to do, especially in the older patient that you have to operate on because of brainstem compression um, or for other reasons that, that can, you know, maybe more personal in nature to the patient's um, desires. But you have to watch those more carefully. The rate of regrowth on a subtotal is about 33%. Okay. 
Well, we are at the end of our time today, so that is going to have to be the last question. I do want to thank Dr. Ogilai and Dr. Dadashi for taking the time to speak to us today, and I want to thank everyone that's attended. A recording of the webinar will be available on our website next week. Um, please mark your calendars for Monday, December 3rd, when we'll host a Facebook Live conversation with Dr. Friedman and Dr. Schwartz from UC San Diego Health. Um, and we'll be discussing hearing preservation using the middle fossa approach as well as treatment of tumor growth post-radiation. Uh, post um, we'll have more details on that on our website and social media pages as the date approaches. Please don't forget to visit our website at www.anausa.org for the latest news and information and for information on how you can get involved within ANA. And don't forget about Giving Tuesday coming up on November 27th. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Melissa. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You Thanks, everyone. John, thank you. Melissa, thank, thank you. you. And talk to you soon.